Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Daniel Wincott. I'm a director of the Governance After Brexit Research Programme, which is associated with UK and a Changing Europe and research director at UK and a Changing Europe. And I'm uh, delighted to uh, welcome everyone to this webinar on, uh, on devolution. Uh, we have a superb panel, uh, Philip Rycroft, was in charge of the UK governance group in the cabinet office for a long time and also uh, permanent secretary at the department for exiting the EU. Um, amongst those of us who work on devolution, uh, he was known as the, uh, the man in Whitehall who really got devolution. Um, uh, so it's fantastic to have him along. We have uh, Professor Elsa Henderson, uh, who uh, directs the uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish election study uh, and has recently published a book on Englishness, co-authored by our third uh, panelist, uh, Professor Richard Wynne-Jones, who uh, also directs the uh, Welsh election study and those two studies work closely together. Um, and finally, we have uh, uh, Professor Sir John Curtis, uh, professor at the University of Strathclyde, a senior fellow at Natsen and Scotson, and well known as a luminary of uh, UK politics and uh, uh, public attitudes. Um, so we're going to start by asking uh, questions to each of the panelists in turn, uh, and I'll start with 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 Philip. Um, I'm I'm keen to. Um, get at the understanding of devolution uh, in, in England, uh, across the UK, but particularly in government, in, uh, in Whitehall and amongst politicians uh, at Westminster. Uh, and I guess my question uh, to you is, uh, when you were working in the Cabinet Office and in charge of these sorts of issues uh, across the UK, um, how did you explain devolution to your colleagues in Whitehall? And you know, was that a straightforward task? Did you find a receptive audience, or, or uh, you know, what were the top two or three challenges and opportunities you had in helping your colleagues to understand the devolution arrangements? Uh, thanks, Dan. A sort of simple question, eh, to get to, to get us going. Um, seven years of my life in Whitehall, I was sort of responsible for trying to encourage my colleagues to uh, engage with understand the devolution settlements. I mean, the blunt truth is that understanding of the politics and the interests of the devolved parts of the UK has never, never been central to Whitehall business. And that was true pre-devolution uh, when most issues were dealt with by the Scottish and Welsh offices. So this was administrative dev devolution, if you like, but those departments of state handled uh, Scottish and Welsh issues. Northern Ireland um, has always been different. It's always been a specialist subject um, in, in Whitehall, engaging different parts of Whitehall because of security issues and so on, but not engaging much of Whitehall. And that, um, of course, is also true post-evolution. And the, the nice little phrase that people have been banding around for a while now, devolve and forget, was in many ways a perfectly rational response uh, to devolution. For most of Whitehall, there was little need uh, or interest in engaging in stuff that was devolved, so education, healthcare, and so on. Um, and on reserved issues, consulting the devolved uh, governments was effectively a pain. It was an additional task you had to do to get your policy moving forward. So there was very little incentive, um, and I think remains the case, uh, for uh, departments dealing with reserved issues to spend a lot of time worrying about what the devolved governments um, are, are thinking. So the whole of the devolved was never really prioritised in Whitehall. Now, you'd have thought that the Scottish independence referendum would have been a bit of a shock to the system. Um, through most of that campaign, uh, most of the South, if I could put it that way, Whitehall and Westminster, didn't think this was going to be a problem. Don't forget, when we set off on that campaign, the polls... Uh, low mid 30s for independence. It was only relatively late in the campaign uh, that the polls tightened. And it was only then, in my experience, that people began to engage emotionally with the possibility that uh, Scotland would leave the UK. 
and that emotional engagement did give us some momentum um, on the sort of devolution settlement front, obviously, uh, the Cameron government, the coalition government uh, committed to the vow in terms of further devolution for Scotland. The Cameron government 2015 carried that through, Scotland out 2016, Wales out 2017. And Cameron himself, I think, recognised the need to improve the capability on devolution in Whitehall. And that's when we set up the UK governance group, which I headed up from 2015 through to 2019. And we did a lot of work on devolution and you and indeed uh, I, my fellow panellists have all been engaged in that one way or another in, in supporting the work the Cabinet Office did to try and improve understanding of these issues in Whitehall. We lent on departments to ensure they had devolution plans. Um, and, and there was, to be fair, some progress. We were getting, we were getting there, but it was hard going. And I think the, the blunt, and again, the, the, just the fact of the matter is that Whitehall, despite that progress, was not sufficiently prepared for the shocks of both Brexit and COVID. Brexit in particular has overwhelmed the capability of Whitehall to understand and deal with devolution. And we see all of that in the way that intergovernmental relations work. Um, just a, a brief advertorial, but Mike Kenny, Jack Sheldon and I have been working on a, a, a piece on intergovernmental relations which will be pub pub published soon by the Constitution Society, really pointing out how inadequate uh, the system of intergovernmental relations has been. You'll have seen the Dunlop review, Andrew Dunlop's review came out yesterday. He makes very much the same point. And I've just been looking at the response from Michael Gove to that. <laughs> it's sort of saying, yeah, there are some issues here, but I think far from a wholehearted commitment to change the way that Whitehall thinks about and deals with uh, the devolved parts of the UK. Thanks very much, Philip. And, and, I, and I would say that your biography, uh, having worked in Edinburgh as well as in London, seems to me to fit the profile that Dunlop is trying to promote uh, amongst uh, civil servants more, more, more broadly. Um, so perhaps you are the exemplar. The, you know, be more Philip Rycroft would be the, yeah, the message for people. Um, I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn to uh, to to Elsa now, and it's a similar set of issues, but uh, but thinking about the level of you know the general public, so public attitudes to an understanding of of the union as a whole and the and the devolution system. There's some interesting uh, stuff in your new book about senses of kind of grievance and discontent and actually a, a kind of lack of understanding or, or engagement. So, um, uh, you know, does, the, does, the, does Whitehall reflect um, uh, public attitudes more, 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 more generally um, yeah. or lead them? Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with I would agree with that. That, that there's some similar themes um, popping up. So I think, I mean, certainly there's some good news for the union. Um, levels of solidarity are typically high, um, and support for sharing of resources in principle is also high. And there's some evidence that COVID has kind of either reinforced that or in Scotland almost kick-started a sense of UK-wide social solidarity. So there's some good news, but but that's kind of the end of my good news part. So the rest of it is all is all challenges. And I think there's I think there's three main ones. One is one is about national identity and patterns in national identity. And it does vary a bit by which survey you're looking at, but we do see that the proportion of people who, if forced to choose, are picking a British identity is significantly lagging the proportion that would pick a Scottish identity or a Welsh identity. And it's more of a, it's more of a dead heat in England, really. We're, we're not yet at the point where we've got more people picking an English identity than a, than a British one if pushed. So that's a challenge. And it's also a challenge that British identity, while declining, is also aligning with different constitutional attitudes in different parts of the UK. So, the reverse of that is that, you know, territorial identity, feeling Scottish and feeling Welsh aligns with um, remain voting, whereas English identity aligns with leave voting. And the, the reverse is true of British identity. So that's that's a challenge. A second challenge is, is grievance, as you've mentioned. There's a considerable sense of grievance across the state. And it, it's fairly omnidirectional. I mean, everyone is kind of convinced that their own part 
gets less than its fair share. Um, everyone seems pretty certain that England gets more than its fair share, but those in England are absolutely certain that it's Scotland that gets more than its fair share. And, and that, that English data kind of helps us to understand that grievance is part of a wider sense of, of Devo anxiety, um, which we talk about in the book. And the target of that Devo anxiety in England is really Scotland. There's a sense it has uh, undue access to resources, undue influence at the, at the heart of the state. So that's a problem. And then there's the problem of, of knowledge, you know, what we refer to in the book as a, a union of ignorance. So knowledge of, of what is devolved and what is reserved is, is, is patchy and it's, it's asymmetrical. Those in the devolved territories tend to know more than those in England, which you can, you can well understand, but they make different kinds of errors. So people in Scotland, when they get it wrong about what's devolved and what's reserved, they tend to underestimate the authority, the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. And people in England, when they get it wrong, they tend to overestimate the legislative competence of Hollywood. And each of those challenges, national identity, knowledge, and, um, and grievance uh, are playing out in different ways because of Brexit and, and because of COVID. So in terms of Brexit, we know that those national identities align differently um, with remain and leave. But we also know that leave and remain identities are significant. And what we're finding is that in different parts of the state, remainers and leavers are willing to put up with radical changes to the constitution, to the union as they know it, in order to get their own way on Brexit. So it's not just leavers who are, who are like this, that's, that's been reported before. It's both leavers and remainers. And in terms of COVID, that patchy knowledge then becomes a problem because there's a clear confusion about what's, what's devolved and what's, what's reserved that's compounded by unclear statements in UK press conferences about what the territorial uh, limit of certain announcements are. You know, the, the UK government in its press conferences and in its messaging is very unclear when it's, when it's talking about things it's doing for England alone and things it's doing for the UK, I spent the summer with a research assistant coding the different press conferences. And you're down in the low single digits per month if you're looking for the number of times it actually admits it's acting only for England when it is. Uh, the media reporting as a result has been really confusing about what applies across the UK and what is only true for certain devolved areas. And that's why Ofcom had to issue guidance in May reminding everyone, please make sure you reflect the multinational multi-level um, reality of, of the United Kingdom when you, when you do your reporting. But we also know that, that the response to COVID has allowed for variation, sometimes in terms of policy, more often in terms of timing, and all of that is having a clear impact on attitudes. And in Scotland, it's manifesting itself in terms of increased support for independence, um, people saying that it's having a positive impact in terms of support for the SNP, and Nicola Sturgeon as well. So all of these things that are kind of recurring challenges in the public opinion data are also burbling up in reaction to, um, and also just sometimes just made clear by Brexit and COVID. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got elections coming up in, in Wales and in Scotland um, in, in May. Uh, and I'm gonna to turn to uh, Richard now to ask about about Wales, and I suppose also to reflect on that that history uh, of Brexit and Brexit processes and then COVID and whether that's having an impact. Yeah, uh, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, in terms of the, the Welsh election, um, those of you who know anything about Welsh politics will know that um, Labour have won every significant election in Wales since 1922. Well, you can argue if European elections were were significant. They're not going to be for my purposes. So basically, Labour's been winning since 1922. So we go into another election where Labour is the clear favourite. Uh, but we've also we've just had another pre-election ritual in Wales, which is an opinion poll which suggests that it's going to go really badly wrong for Labour this time. And so I see that it's being widely reported that First Minister uh, Mark Drakeford is about to lose his seats. Uh, breaking news that is based on very little knowledge of the constituency in which uh, Mark Drakeford is actually 
standing in, and I suspect he'll be fine. Um, in terms of, in terms of the, just in terms, let's just talk very quickly about the election first. In terms of the outcome of the election, we have a semi-proportional um, electoral system in Wales, which is very sticky. By which I mean that actually, for Labour to get fewer than twenty-four seats and more than thirty seats is very, very, very difficult. No matter what happens, because uh, because of the way that the the um, constituency elements and the list elements interact. Um, so basically, in terms of the outcome, the real, and this isn't an original point, but the, the real action, there are 22 constituencies ranging in, all across South Wales, ranging from the Gower to the English border. Uh, Labour hold 20, 21 of the 22 seats. And if they start losing those constituencies, they won't get compensation on the list, okay? So they're absolute losses for them. If they lose seats in other regions, then there's every, every likelihood that they get compensated on, on, on the list. So basically it'll be those seats, the Conservatives are challenging in some, like the Vale of Glamorgan, for example, Ply Cymru are challenging in others, maybe Caerphilly. So we'll, th those, are the kinds, those are the kinds of things we'll be looking for. In terms of issues, obviously COVID is a very, very important issue. Um, and in terms of Labour, they now have a real asset in the First Minister. Back at the time of the 2019 general election in Wales, um, Mark Drakeford was largely unknown, I think, to the Welsh population as a whole. He's now the most visible pop, uh, politician in Wales bar, um, bar Boris Johnson. He's also popular, so he's now a, a real asset for them. COVID, and in particular, the relative performance of the Welsh level vis-a-vis -vis the UK level is going to be really important. The Conservatives are basically saying it's been done better in England. That is basically their kind of key message. That's not always bought, uh, especially by supporters of the Labour Party and Plaid Cymru. But I would also expect, final point here, Dan, I would also expect the Constitution to play an actually really important role in this election. I mean, what, since one of the really interesting impacts of Brexit is the way that it's turbocharged the independence movement in Wales. Independence was not an issue at all in Wales until about a couple of years ago. Brexit has changed that, not only Brexit, but the way the UK government has handled Brexit has changed that. And going into the election, both in terms of the main challenges to Labour, the Conservatives and Plaid Cymru both want to talk about independence. Plaid Cymru, because they want to detach, they want to try to de detach that very substantial group of Labour voters who support independence. They want to try to detach those. Whether they'll succeed or not is another issue. The Conservatives also want to use it to, again, I mean, they're very much attacking uh, Labour as you're trying to undermine the union. Okay, so both Plaid and the Conservatives, for very different reasons, want to talk about the Constitution. Labour are kind of caught in, in a really difficult space there because on the one hand, um, on the one hand, they want to argue what we want is enhanced evolution, which is the sweet spot still in terms of the Welsh electorate. But by talking about that, they are in danger of showing that they can't deliver that. Okay because obviously the UK government is not interested in, in that agenda. Labour looks very far away from power at the UK level. So how the constitution plays out in the uh, campaign is going to be really fascinating. Thanks, Richard. That's, uh, that's fascinating. John, similar sort of uh, a question for you about, uh, about the position in Scotland, where clearly independence is going to be a big, big uh, question in the, May, in the May election. You know, and, uh, you know, it seems that um, Brexit is uh, having an impact on, um, on public opinion um uh, in, in in scotland and nicola sturgeon seems to be seems to have gained quite a lot of uh prominence and support through the through the regular briefings and and, and the covid process 
but we also have the much reported uh, uh, sturgeon, salmon, stromash, um, and you know some suggestions that that may have had had uh, a, an impact on 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 attitudes. Uh, you're still on mute, John. Uh, sorry about that. Um, well, if you were to take a quick glance at the now innumerable opinion polls, uh, the Scottish election seems to be had to being polled almost as heavily as a UK general election is. You might imagine what, wonder what all the excitement was about. On average, on the constituency vote, the uh, uh, SNP are standing at 48%, 42% on the list vote. Their nearest opponents, the Conservatives, are on 22% on the two ballots. So you might anticipate that an election in which the leading party is 20 points or more ahead was heading to be perhaps one of the world's most boring contests. This, however, is not the case. The, it now seems to be uh, accepted um, certainly implicitly by um, Boris Johnson in his speech to the Conservative, Conservative Virtual Conference, uh, and as it were, uh, also a number of us have been making this point for a while, that so far as the SNP are concerned and their hopes of being able to hold a, another independence referendum, that the crucial question is whether or not they can get an overall majority on their own. Why? Well, because Back in 2011, the uh, SNP got an overall majority on their own. And at that point, the then UK Conservative Prime Minister, David Cameron, accepted that that outcome gave the then uh, SNP government under Alex Salmond the moral right to hold a referendum and the 2014 contest ensued. And it's clearly going to be much more difficult for the UK government simply to say no and certainly simply to claim that people in Scotland don't want a referendum, if indeed, despite the fact that we're using a proportional representation system, uh, the SNP were to get an overall majority. Now, it so happens that where we are at at the moment, those figures I quoted earlier, which are somewhat lower than they were for the SNP at the back end of last year, um, it's frankly a 50-50 shot as to whether or not the SNP would or would not get an overall majority. Um, and whether or not they do so is indeed, I think, one of the things that's going to be settled in the next seven weeks. And, you know, at the back of that, people's reaction to COVID and to the Sturgeon, Salmon, Rao, et cetera, were maybe part of that story. The second crucial thing about the election um, is that it's beginning to look as though there may well be a serious battle for second place. Um, on average, the Conservatives have already said 22 points on the two ballots, Labour at 20 on the constituency, 18 on the list. So Labour is still behind and they've been behind in the polls throughout the whole of the last five years. But there is some sign that the gap may be narrowing. Um, and there, there are two things that flow from that. The, the first is that one of the paradoxes of this election is that if indeed the UK government is going to, if the, if the election is going to deliver the outcome that the UK government is hoping for, that is that there isn't a um, overall majority for the SNP, they are essentially going to be reliant on the Labour Party taking votes off the SNP. It's pretty clear that voters are, are SNP voters are more likely to switch to the Labour Party than they are to the Conservatives and the opposite is true in the, in the opposite direction. So that is a crucial battle. But if the um, SNP do get an overall majority and therefore we are talking about you know, a serious push for an independence referendum um, and at the same time however the Labour Party comes second the fragmentation of the unionist movement which is arguably already pretty serious becomes even worse because at the moment at least the Conservatives are as it were the unchallenged leaders on the unionist side because they are the largest unionist party at Holyrood and they do run the government at Westminster but if Labour were to overtake them such that um, they were uh, to uh, no, 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 now be the largest unionist party in Hollywood, then the question of who leads unionism in Scotland becomes even more fraught uh, than it is at the, the moment. So that's, as it were, I think, you know, the immediate tactics. It, the other thing, however, that it's important to understand is that the structure of party support in Scotland 
is now significantly different from what it was in 2016 and indeed even from what it was in 2011 in two ways. The first is the role of Brexit. Um, there was, until the Brexit referendum took place, there was no relationship at all between people's attitudes towards the European Union and whether or not they supported independence. Those days are over. Um, it's now support for independence is markedly high amongst those who voted, voted Remain and amongst Leave. And in my mind, there is no doubt that the reason why we are now at roughly 50-50 for independence is essentially the pursuit of Brexit. The pursuit of Brexit has undoubtedly uh, seriously undermined public support for the union north of the border. But it's also changed the character of SNP support. If you look at uh, the people who voted for the SNP in 2015 when they got 50% of the vote, their support was almost as high amongst Leave voters as it was amongst Remain voters. That disappeared at the 2017 UK general election. The principal reason why the SNP lost ground in that election had little to do with the row about Indy Ref 2 and everything to do with the fact um, that Leave voters were uh, leaving the SNP and indeed flocking to the Tories. Um, and that is still the case. The SM, you know, the SNP are about twice as popular amongst Remain voters as Leave voters. But the second and perhaps even more crucial way in which things are different is this. Um, the reason originally why the SNP said, well, we'll have a referendum uh, and we will regard a referendum as uh, the pathway uh, to uh, in, a potential pathway to independence was because they wanted to encourage people who weren't in favour of independence to vote for the party in devolved elections. It was a product of electoral weakness. Those days are over. Back in 2011, nearly 40% of those people who were in favour of devolution rather than independence voted for the SNP. The SNP won in that election on the back of competence, not because of people's views about independence. Even in 2016, around a fifth or so of people who at that stage were said they would vote no in another independence referendum voted for the SNP. In, however, now this election, at least so far as whether people vote for the SNP or not, looks like a quasi-referendum. On average in the polls from which you can extract the information, 87% of those people who say they would currently vote yes in an independence referendum saying they're going to vote for the SNP, and only 7% of those people who say they would vote no say they're going to vote for the SNP. In other words, support for independence and support for the SNP are now synonymous with each other, or virtually synonymous with each other, in a way that has not previously been uh, the case. Um, uh, one, you know, one implication of that, which unionists need to think about, uh, if indeed the SNP do get an overall majority but are denied a referendum, is that I suspect what would happen is that the SNP would go back to their previous policy, which was if we win a majority of either the Scottish seats at Westminster or the seats at Holyrood, we will regard that as a mandate for independence and will quote, and Joanna Cherry has already done this, quote the result of the 1918 election in Ireland as the precedent. And I think the point now to understand is that if indeed the character of SNP support it now continues to be as it is, their strategic position is much strengthened. A, there are far more people in favor of independence now uh, than there once were, and B, that the SNP can certainly deliver a majority of Scottish seats at Westminster off the back of that support. And if we end up with another hung parliament after 2023 or 2024 election, you may find that the SNP are in a position to gum up the Westminster work. So just be aware that a referendum as the pathway to independence is not always it not, has always been regarded by the SNP as the only pathway and if it is if it, if it is indeed successfully blocked it may have repercussions for how the SNP comport themselves in future but the, given the changed character of their support they are perhaps now in a much stronger strategic position to, to consider an alternative pathway than was once uh, uh, indeed the case. Thanks very much John that's uh, that's that's really fascinating. Um, I'm going to ask some, some follow-up questions, but I'd like you all to feel free to kind of respond to each other. And I'm going to try and pick up uh, some of the questions that have been asked on Slido. I would, uh, I would also ask the audience to, uh, to vote for your 
your preferred questions so that I can get a sense of uh, what the audience priorities are. Uh, but but picking up on uh, 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 from where where John you you left off, um, we've had a couple of questions. One from Sheila Gardner about uh, uh, about whether there'll be such a thing as quote British politics. Uh, uh, in, in in the future, and another from Garant Talvin Davis um, uh, about whether the Dunlop review is the right way forward, even for unionists. And I'd try and frame those together in a question about uh, about the prospects for politics uh, across Great Britain, maybe across the UK, um, looking at looking ahead, uh, and, and whether we seem to be. You know, even short of independence in Scotland or or, or a move towards uh, um, a border poll in Ar Ireland, we seem to be in a position where the uh, the campaigning imperatives for leading parties in each part of the UK in each part of Britain uh, seem to be um, generating potential kind of divisions and conflicts, uh, uh, accentuating divisive identities um, rather than uh, providing a context in which, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of um, the appetite for, for solidarity that, that Elsa touched on in, in, in the mass public is, uh, uh, is accentuated. And if you think about that, you know, in terms of current, uh, say, UK government strategies, uh, you know, Philip, you mentioned the, the the Dunlop review and Michael Gove's response to it. I mean, yesterday we also had Oliver Dowden making some announcements about flags, uh, which um, which make Michael Gove's comment seem much more emollient by by comparison. So, I guess my question is, even short of um, short of the dramatic constitutional changes, are we set for a period of kind of mutually hostile deadlock across across the UK. Does anyone want to jump in on that? I mean, if, yeah, that, ha happy to respond to that. In a way, um, we've had deadlock. I mean, really, you know, Brexit was transformational in this debate. Um, it sort of shattered the ability of the intergovernmental relations system to contain the differences between uh, the four governments. Um, and it is, as, as uh, uh, John has, has said it has changed the dynamic of the way in which people think about uh, their allegiances in, in Scotland. Um, if you think about this, if you step back for a minute, you essentially have around 50%, maybe a little bit higher than that, of people in Scotland wanting to withhold their consent to what in Scotland is seen as a voluntary union. I mean, this, this puts the question of the future of the United Kingdom uh, you know, very sharply to the forefront. And I see personally, and I think what I've heard from John and Elsa um, uh, today would reinforce this, I see no sign of a sort of a Quebec style reversal of that opinion. And if you dig into the polling, the younger end of the population very much more in favour of independence, the older end of the population. So the demographics appear to work for the nationalists. The proposals that Andrew Dunlop has made are, I think, good, very solid. Uh, he was asked to address a relatively constrained issue about how Whitehall approaches devolution. And he's come up with, I think, a series of, of very sound proposals on how Whitehall works, intergovernmental relations and so on. Um, uh, and that's the government's response to that, I think, a little bit mealy mouth. I think the most interesting thing, if you watch the Prime Minister at the Liaison Committee yesterday responding to Stephen Crabb about his um, commitment to engaging with Mark Drakeford and Nicola Sturgeon, the First Ministers of, 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 of Wales and Scotland, he can't quite get himself to say, yes, I am the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and I need to talk to these people. And intergovernmental relations needs to be a consensual, you know, an activity where we get together and we seek consensus on a way forward. He just can't seem to get himself uh, into that sort of space. So um, question one, will the government um, uh, actually push forward on the Dunlop review in the right spirit? It's not just about form, it's about substance as well. But the bigger question is, is that sufficient? Is that going to be sufficient to persuade um, those people in Scotland, the increasing number of folk in Wales who are indie curious, uh, and people in Northern Ireland, that this union is still, still sustainable. 
or do we need a more fundamental reappraisal about how this union holds together? I personally think that's probably the biggest question in British politics right now and will be for the four or five years ahead, if, if probably longer. Um, and I think the, in a way Brexit and the COVID have obscured that, um, but it's not going to go away anytime soon. Thanks. Richard, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, setting the Dunlop review to one side for a moment, I, I would say that, generally speaking, unionists are doing a great job of undermining the union at the moment. Um, and there are so many multiple dimensions to this. I mean, uh, and, the, the, and the, this is, it's been obviously going in this direction for a long time. I remember in the aftermath of the 2014 uh, Indy Ref being, being invited to a meeting uh, somewhere in Whitehall where I was met these you know, very interesting people who basically said, we've learned the lesson from Indy Ref. What we need to do is to do more to show the benefits of the union to these places who apparently don't even know they're in the union, apparently. Anyway, so it was basically, we want, we want more flags. And this, so the flag thing isn't new, right? And I, and I remember saying at the time, you do realise that every bypass in the South Wales Valleys has got a European Union flag on it. And actually, it's not really done much uh, in terms of um, um, dampening down Euroscepticism in those communities. That's so crude. And I think there's, there's something, there's also something very interesting. I think, you know, one of the most interesting things that we saw reported about British politics in the last few months is these conversations between Michael Gove and Gordon Brown talking about the future of the, of the union. And I think, you know, for those people to come together, I think is in itself very interesting. But I think, you know, I also think it's fascinating that the, the, the two major British parties have, have essentially devolved thinking about the union to their Scottish branches or elements of their Scottish branches. And so there, and what, and there, are, there are some characteristic errors that arise from that. One is to discount views in England, okay? So what's the, what's the centre-left view of how you resolve this issue? Somehow regionalise England. Well, you know, that is a bit of a problem, guys, because the English aren't particularly keen on this. The other one is, is shared rule, okay? And shared rule plays into this very dearly held view of Scottish unionists, that this is a partnership of equals somehow, right? And Actually, guys, England is 84% of the whole. Uh, Scotland's around 7%. There, there's a kind of real politique element that comes in there. You know, even the flag thing from a Welsh perspective. I mean, where's Wales on the Union, Jack? Yesterday we had a <laughs> talking about the kingdom of England and Wales. So, yeah, yeah. So just reminders of military conquest, right? You know, it's the whole thing is it's so, it's so ill-conceived. You've got all. You've got clearly a lot of bright people sitting there coming up with these ruses, but I actually think that they serve to undermine the union because they, you know, they consistently ignore attitudes in England as if they don't matter. They consistently get the wrong tone in Wales, which is pushing up support for independence, and it doesn't actually work in Scotland either and Northern Ireland. Well, you know, there's an economic border in the Irish Sea these days, so you know. That, that shows a hell of a commitment there. Um, so we, we have a bunch of questions in, in, in the Slido about whether Labour needs to adopt a truly federal uh, devolution style about, um, about uh, uh, metro mayors in England and whether that's part of the, the, the solution. An interesting aspect uh, that Muriel Cameron has raised which is related to this, but which gets much less uh, traction, much less discussion than federalism in general, is, is whether a move to proportional representation at the UK level might be a prerequisite for making, making the union work uh, in, in the future. Elsa, you had your hand up. Um, uh, so I don't know if that follows on from these, uh, these points. I can I can pivot quite quickly. Um, no, my my point was just going to be about something that that Philip mentioned about Quebec. I mean, the, the as a Canadian watching watching all of this, and it, it does seem to be as if they're they're going through the kind of 
federal liberal, liberal party of, of Canada kind of playbook in terms of how they're going to cope with a separatist movement that's inordinately popular. And, and they do seem to be kind of, they know that support has fallen in Quebec and they're not really sure which of the initiatives the Liberals tried work. So they're just going to try them all in order from the, from the very beginning. And, and the flags, I mean, the, the, the flags are not what caused support to fall. So you, you, you despair, I think, sometimes for that no one's actually looked at a, at a comparative case. But I, but I can talk about federalism. So in, in terms of whether, whether it's a, a solution, I mean, Richard was saying that federalism is a, a, a problem because England doesn't like it. I think the, the kind of larger problem is that, is that it's the ad hoc reactions are part of the problem. So Northern Ireland's a problem or Scotland's a problem. So right, we'll, we'll do something to solve the problem, the immediate problem of Scotland, but that just ends up annoying everybody else. So then everyone else is annoyed. So then you have to turn to whoever is next in line and kind of solve them. But that then annoys, that then annoys England. So that pairs with the fact that there isn't popular support for federalism in England. There are two things that that we know in England. One is that people want an England-wide solution. So they want something that treats England as England. And that is part of the reason why there it was always far greater support among the, the possible solutions of uh, dealing with the English question or the English problem, why there was always much more support for English votes for English laws. Um, so we know that there is support for treating England as England, an England-wide solution. We also know, uh, and we also know that people want something to be done. If we ask them about a range of options, they say, yes, I'll have that one. And oh, yes, I'll have that one. And I'll have, I'll have that one too. So there's appetite for change. The other thing we know is that local identities are in, within England are very strong. And there is also a, a concern about centralized government. And there is also support for subsidiarity, this notion that you can take decisions at the lowest possible level, which would be a reinvigorated local democracy. But the problem is that in, in seeking to address the problems of both, the, of both England and the Union, people seem to take these two things. We need to do something about England. And also we know that people like subsidiarity and the solutions seem to try and come in at the middle. Uh, right, okay, well let's, you know, they want something done in England. They like subsidiarity. Let's, let's carve England up into, into bits that, that are roughly around the size of Scotland and we'll, we'll, we'll solve that problem. That, that ticks the box for dealing with England. And it also ticks the box for dealing with the union because now we've kind of solved this problem of, of asymmetrical devolution. And the problem is that there just isn't any support for it. We've, we've been polling since 2011 and we have never managed to, you know, we kept thinking maybe we're asking the questions wrong. And we, we have never managed to find any form of support for any kind of a regional solution to this problem, however you identify the problem. So federalism is, is kind of like the zombie policy. It keeps popping up, but it has, it has very little detail and it has very little support. Thanks, Elsa. John, I'll come to you in just a second, but Elsa, if I could follow up. Um, a, a little advert here too for some work we're doing through UK and Changing Europe, some qualitative work we did over the summer actually with Natsen, uh, uh, looking at uh, comfortably off uh, folk who voted leave in the Brexit referendum across a number of parts of, of England. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that popped up for me from that work was, it felt a little bit paradoxical. Uh, in, in, in other words, that across England, um, there seemed to be some sort of skepticism about how effectively Whitehall and Westminster were working for people, you know, in, in, in various different parts of England. At the same time, there didn't really seem to be an appetite for any other level of government to kind of sort out the problem. So, so there was a sense in which, you know, uh, uh, they were kind of skeptical about or, or had a, a, a sense that, you know, Whitehall and Westminster weren't really working for them and didn't really understand them. At the same time, they still looked to Whitehall and Westminster as the place that should should sort things out. Uh, does that does that ch uh, chime with the with the work you've done? Uh, do you think it's a paradox, or is you know is it really paradoxical, or is there some way of uh, of working through it? It certainly chimes with the with the survey research. So we we know. 
from as far back as, I mean, I know you know this, but as far back as 2008, that when you, when you poll in different regions across Europe and they ask, and you ask, who do you think has the most influence over politics right now? And who do you want to have the most influence? Um, in England, they were off the charts in terms of perceiving the EU to have an influence over the running of things. Um, and, but, and if you ask where they, where they wanted that power to lie, it was, it was at, it was at the level of the UK Parliament. It wasn't. It wasn't below that. So it's entirely consistent with what we've been finding before. And one other. But I mean, we do find inconsistency. So when we started polling, we were asking about um, support for an English Parliament, and we found incredible support for an English. If you know, if you forced people to choose from a list of possible things that they could have. We got support for an English parliament of about 40% or something at a time when no one was, I mean, no one's still talking about it, but no one, no one was talking about it. But when we changed the question, as we did from time to time to kind of adapt to what parties were actually offering, and we included an option that had English votes for English laws, so a reformed UK parliament, then support for that English parliament dropped and support for the reformed UK parliament um, was, was very high. So it's entirely consistent with what we're seeing, both in terms of long-standing preference of pulling powers back from away to UK Parliament, but also seeing a reformed UK Parliament as, as a popular solution um, in, 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 in contrast to any, any new options, really. It is, it is a continually uh, well-polling beast. Thanks, John. Yes, um, the phrase the end of British politics, which one of the, your questioners raised, was of course uh, originally coined by the late uh, Bill Miller um, in his book on basically uh, uh, Scottish politics in the, in the 1970s. Um, and I certainly would certainly argue that maybe you, might, you might want to argue that Bill's title was a little premature. But that said, I think certainly it's been the case since 2015 that we have not had British politics. That is, you know, one of the things that one has to realise about the United Kingdom is that basically Northern Ireland's party system left the British party system, or weak as the connections already were, in the wake of the Troubles in the early 1970s. And uh, the Scottish party system, which has always been under challenge, uh, certainly was uh, became very different from the British party system in the wake of the 2015 uh, general election. So I think certainly British policy is dead. But the other reason for remembering Bill Miller comes back to this question about federalism and compromise, etc. cetera. Um, one of the wisest things I ever heard Bill say um, was to argue that in Scotland, the Labour Party was the centre party and it faced many of the similar problems that the Liberal Democrats faced south of the border on potentially being squeezed from both ends. And certainly, you know, the problem that the Scottish Labour Party has in spades north of the border is, well, the UK party doesn't want to talk about Brexit because Brexit undermines its electoral coalition. And the, Labour, the party north of the border doesn't want to talk about end, uh, the constitutional question because that splits its coalition uh, 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 north of the border. Uh, could we please talk about something else? The trouble is, as I already suggested earlier, there isn't that much interest in something else. But what's also important, I think, is that we are now in a very different environment from the environment that existed around 2011, 2012, 2013 on the constitutional question. Then we had um, parties that were willing to contemplate more devolution, even though they were opposed to independence. And we had a Scottish government that had indeed toyed with the idea of more devolution as an alternative to independence. And the opinion, so at the elite level, there was still a potential bridge and uh, at terms of the public level, uh, there was very considerable support for the idea that became known as Devo Max. Now, in the end, the two elites decided to play poker and just have the single question. Um, but what's now the position is that we have uh, a SMP elite, which is now very clearly determinedly sovereigntist in the sense that it thinks that Scotland should be governing its own affairs. And that sovereignist perspective has been reinforced by the experience of Brexit. 
But equally, the UK government now is also a sovereigntist government. It has uh, uh, never accepted the legitimacy of uh, sharing sovereignty with Brussels. And it frankly doesn't seem to accept the legitimacy of sharing decision making with the devolved administrations. And this UK government has done much more to uh, reduce the scope of the devolution settlement than any previous government has. Unsurprisingly, against that backdrop, you know, uh, uh, Richard and Elsie have quite rightly pointed out the lack of support for federalism in England. The trouble is now that the middle way in Scotland, it has now also basically disappeared off the public's radar. I mean, there have been a couple of polls recently that have asked people whether or not, what, uh, how would they vote when the choice was between more, uh, between independence, more devolution and the status quo. And more devolution tends to come now a poor third. So we are, and we are now talking about environment where the elites have polarized and the electorate have polarized in their wake. That makes life difficult uh, for the Labour Party. But this is why at the end of the day, we are now uh, looking at a pretty uh, existential fight over questions of legitimacy and governance and identity, which look awfully similar to the fights and arguments about uh, Brexit. It's just, of course, that the irony is that a UK sovereignist government that was uh, desperate to get out of one single market is desperate to keep together another single market. Um, and that, of course, just simply reflects the fact that uh, uh, what it does or doesn't regard as being legitimate. But the paradox is certainly staring you in the face north of the border. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to ask a couple of a couple of questions, one about England and one about um, Barnet and, and, and budgets. Uh, so to, to start with England, we've had John Cartledge asking, constitutionally speaking, why is no party offering a credible problem, a credible solution to the English problem? Uh, and, and then also um, a question uh, about whether there's evidence for a positive English identity as distinct from a negative response to Scottish, Welsh and Irish assertions of identity. I think we've got some expertise on this panel on those questions. <laughs> Who wants to take it first? I was going to suggest Richard might want the party one. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Richard. Yeah, well, that was an unexpected uh, throw of the rugby ball, so I wasn't quite. Um, so, um, in terms of the so in terms of the question about the parties, the Conservatives think they've solved it. I mean, I think this is the the key thing. English votes for English laws has been introduced. Um, we tried to poll. Um, on it, and we worked out, I think uh, Ilsa may correct me if I'm wrong, but we think 2% of people in England know it happened. Um, um, so, but they think that that, that, that it's, it's, it's solved. And certainly in our, our book, we, we, we disagree with that. But so the Conservatives think it's resolved. Labour find this horribly, horribly difficult um, because it stretches their Cross Britain coalition, um, you know, Labour MPs. There's nobody in the Labour Party who's more keen on English regional devolution uh, than Welsh MPs or Scottish Labour MPs when they existed. Okay, um, um, because it, 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 they think it, it resolves the issues with the union uh, without undermining their position. Labour have all kinds of issues around. English identity and how to talk about it. And I, I've done so many of, of these meetings and I have people telling me that somehow it's inherently reactionary and so on and so forth. And so I find this extremely difficult. And of course, are then extremely vulnerable to it when the Conservatives mobilise it in the way that they very deliberately did in 2015. Um, so, and I'm not going to talk about the Lib Dems policy. You can you can email me after the meeting about if you're really interested in that. But I think you know. So the Conservatives think it's resolved. Uh, um, uh, Labour just find it horribly difficult and have changed policies. They had a minister for England. You know, they, they just don't know what to do in this space, and they need to engage. So, so if I could push uh, push you collectively a little bit more on this. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, as 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 a 
a political scientist, um, I'm um, often inclined to think that, uh, uh, you know, that, that institutions and leaders can shape and reshape things. And, you know, over quite a long period of time, uh, you know, since Margaret Thatcher uh, abolished the GLC and the Metropolitan County Councils, uh, um, sub-central government in England has been limited and restricted uh, and, and cut back. There are a few examples of, you know, attempts at, at rebuilding and through the COVID pandemic, some of them, those have also gained prominence, you know, Andy Burnham as King of the North and so on. Um, is, is there, is there any, anything in your work, uh, you know, not, and, and what you've said so far is pretty clear on this, but is there anything in your work that suggests that, you know, if there is a political framework, if there are institutions, if there are prominent leaders, uh, uh, that aspect of English uh, uh, politics might change. Philip, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, no, not so much on the opinions, which I'll leave to the experts, but just on the, the you know, where uh, questions around devolving power in England have gone over time. Um, you know, one of the big issues that UK governments have been struggling with for, for decades now is regional inequality. And you think successive governments have attempted to address that through the regional development agencies, through local enterprise partnerships and so on, chopping and changing regularly, you know, pretty, pretty much every government has another bash at it. Something sort of quite interesting began to happen in the coalition government, which was um, a, a far more sort of asymmetric approach to it, recognising the points that Alison and Richard have made about the, you know, there is no support for a regional agenda in England generally, unless as I do, you come from Yorkshire, where of course the answer is self-government for Yorkshire. Um, and you bits like Cornwall and so on, you, where there are quite strong identities, but that is not, you can't um, create a map of a regional England that people are sat satisfied with. But what you can do and what you're beginning to see happen in a rather incohate way is respond more to those more local identities so the Metro Mayors, I think, you know, people who live in Manchester or there or thereabouts, there is something that you can work with there, the northeast of England, uh, bits of Yorkshire and so on. Um, so you have begun to see in a very ill-organised way and a very complicated way, the beginnings of some sort of devolution in England, which does map up to an extent, it seems to me, with those local identities. Um, I, I think my own perspective on this as somebody who's worked in devolved government and in, in, in Whitehall over the years is England does need more devolved government. It's extraordinary that you have, for example, the Department for Education uh, essentially running individual schools across England. There's nowhere else in the developed world which is quite like it. So there is, a, it seems to me, um, a de facto case for more devolution. The form of it, however has to be quite sophisticated because it can't go down that regional track and it does have to seek to respond, it seems to me, to those, to those more rooted local identities. I think it's possible, um, but the one thing about the UK government in this space, um, an, an easy accusation to make, but I think quite a lot of truth in it, it finds it very, very difficult to think coherently and consistently about these issues in England but then how you relate what's happening in, in England to the rest of the UK. Um, so that is a critique of our sort of uh, governing classes, I guess, um, the, the, the ability to think deep and long term uh, about the constitutional structure of the country is wanting. And this government, as everybody has said, I, I think is, has prioritised above everything else, essentially a hard Brexit, um, uh, despite the cost uh, uh, potentially to the, this union. Thank you. Uh, Elsa, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I wanted to come in on the, how do you make English identity a, a, a positive identity? And, I, and I, I guess I had a question about, well, what makes a, what makes a, what makes a positive national identity rather than, a, rather than a negative identity? But I think I know what, what that means in the context of English identity. Someone reviewed our book recently and said we managed to hide our distaste um, for those with an English national identity fairly well. And that angered me so much because there was this lazy assumption that if you're not in England, if you look, if you study people with uh, 
an English national identity and Englishness, that you're doing it so that you can prove that they're they're wrong in some way or they're backward in some way. And I I think that's that's deeply concerning. I think um, I think it's also worth pointing out that anything that is true of English identity in England, in terms of the political views that it's, it aligns with, is, is equally true of British identity in Scotland. And yet we don't get people talking about how British identity in Scotland is a negative identity. So there's something very particular about the framing of English national identity that's, that's an issue here. I think the point is about how you detach it from its from its position in terms of a left-right scale or an interpretation of, of certain constitutional, constitutional events. So you, how do you detach it from something that is the preserve of only the Conservative Party or detach it from being the preserve of only those, those on the right? And I think that the solution is fairly simple. You just have to engage with it and not be squeamish about it. I think, it's, I think that is the entire answer. And I think part of that is about how you frame what the nation is and what the nation believes and what the nation stands for. You, you have a similar debate in Scotland going on about the right of the SNP to claim what it, how it interprets Scottishness and Scottish national identity. And those on the, on the right saying, hang on a minute, you don't, you're not the voice of Scotland. Um, you, are, you are not synonymous with, with Scottishness and Scottish national identity. And I think part of it, you might think, right, well, that's actually quite difficult because you have to think that the, the, set, the political center of gravity is, is, is to the left in Scotland and the political center of gravity is, is to the right in England. And so therefore it, it would be hard to frame their national identities as anything other than aligned with those slightly left-leaning or slightly right-leaning uh, tendencies. But the fundamental fact of the matter is that if you if you look at people's political attitudes, if you look at social attitudes, core social values, there's actually not much difference between Scotland and England. And what you're finding is, yes, we come to different conclusions on constitutional issues, but the core values we have about how we're supposed to treat other people, what is the role for government, there's very little difference there. And everything else is a perception. So it's the perception, it's the perceived center of gravity being to the left in Scotland. And it's a perceived center of gravity about being to the right in England. And all of that is framing. So if the issue is how do you change the construction of English national identity, it just requires those who are not engaging with it to not be so squeamish about engaging with it. I think that's the answer. Uh, that's that's really fascinating. I mean, I think there's also a bit of a tendency for people to move to a very swift homogenization of places and spaces. I can remember talking early on after the Brexit referendum at an event in central London uh, where another speaker said, of course, you know, being from London, you'll have never met uh, anyone who voted leave. Um, and this was, uh, uh, you know, an event held at a university located uh, at the old Olympic visit village in Stratford. And I was looking east from there to uh, Barking and Dagenham and Havering and, 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 you know, places where there were lots and lots of Brexit voters, never mind the fact that there are also uh, people who voted for leave in places where clear majorities voted remain. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the, I'm not aware at any rate of much work that's tried to interrogate uh, leave voters in Scotland as a group. Um, and, and, you know, these kind of uh, too rapid homogenization of places uh, often direct even our research attention away from the, the potentially more interesting and knottier issues in, in, in those sorts of places. I said I was gonna move on to finance and Barnet. Uh, we, we, we had a question, uh, the name here is, Hebelink, uh, or at least the tag, uh, saying no one has yet mentioned the leverage against devolution following from the current budget situation. Uh, Emir Lewis asked, can the Barnett formula survive? Um, it might be interesting to frame this a little bit also in the context of, of COVID and responses to COVID, where my sense is that actually the responses across uh, across GB and maybe across the UK have been much more similar than the high level focus on difference sometimes suggests. 
And, and I'm, I'm really intrigued about why that's the case. And I think some of it, at least, must have to do with uh, uh, reserve power control over, uh, over furlough in particular. I mean, devolved decisions about lockdown uh, necessarily will be conditioned by the opportunity uh, uh, for uh, the, the financial support through the furlough scheme. But, uh, uh, you know, budget leverage against devolution in Scotland. Can the Barnett formula survive? Have I got any takers on those issues? We've got about 10 minutes to go. Oh, um, Richard's hand went up first and then John. So I'll go that way around. But, oh, but please jump sorry. in. I do apologise to John. I was clearly quick on the draw there. Um, so um, can it survive? Um, yes, um, very obviously. Um, uh, it's been... Um, the, the issue with Barnett, obviously, is from a Welsh perspective, is manifestly un, unfair uh, to Wales, uh, and it's extremely generous towards Scotland. Uh, they they have found a way of making it less unfair to Wales by putting in the flaw, and that there's a, there's a mechanism which stops it becoming grotesquely unfair for Wales. Um, changing it for Scotland would involve such a massive financial hit to the Scottish budget. That you know, it's basically the one way that you do guarantee a majority for independence. So that I think that it's it's highly likely that it continue. It can, it there are still huge issues with it. We uh, the the Governance Centre in Cardiff that I direct published a report this week on the impact on transport spending of the fact that the UK government has decided that HS2 benefits Wales. Uh, you just look where HS2 is to be found and work out how that benefit Wales. Wales loses out billions of pounds on that basis and can't do anything about it. So there are issues, but I think it's, it's, it can survive. I think actually moving forward, one of the interesting challenges to it is that the UK government has taken upon itself the right to spend money in devolved areas. Okay. And I think that if it then, you know, for example, in, in building a, a tunnel or whatever. They, why, I, I, I don't know what the latest plan is in terms of uh, linking up Northern Ireland and Scotland, a roundabout in the Isle of Man, I think, under the sea was the last I heard. But I mean, if that is, if that's added to Scottish and Northern Ireland spending, if they build a, um, a extraordinarily expensive uh, motorway through a bog uh, around Newport in South Wales, does that money then against the will of the Welsh Parliament? Do they then add that to the, you know, how they deal with all of that in, in the context of public finances may strain it uh, even further, but I think it will survive uh, because changing it is so negative in the context of Scotland. So it's the cockroach of UK public policy. It survives everything. Uh, John. Uh, you're on mute still. I'm relying here on conversations with the economist colleagues at Strathclyde. Um, one of the little talked about consequences of COVID uh, and the vast increase in UK government spending, uh, spending which has generated Barnet consequentials, is that it substantially reduced the proportion of Scot the Scottish government's income that is coming from the devolved tax base. Uh, and in addition, uh, they also tell me that the attempts to, the, the one bit of the devolution of, of, of the tax base that is meant to occur, still meant to occur in the wake of the Smith Commission of 2016 is the devolution of, or the, the assignment of devolved revenues of, uh, from VAT uh, to the Scottish Government, that that is also currently hitting uh, bureaucratic trouble. Um, so one of the uh, interesting things about the situation we're at as we, the Scottish government is very, very keen uh, to suggest that Scotland should be striking out on its own um, and indeed has today uh, departed very significantly from UK government policy on the payment of health workers is that actually it's doing so against the backdrop of a budget which is now more dependent on the Barnet consequentials than certainly was envisaged in the post Smith. Commission era. Um, so that, 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 that's a, a, an irony and a consideration uh, uh, to take on board. One of the frustrations undoubtedly that the UK government have in the wake of that uh, 
is, and I think, you know, what it underlies the Dunlop report, it underlines what, what UK government's been doing with the levelling up fund, is that indeed, while we give the Scottish government money, they decide how to spend it, and then they get the credit. Uh, so all of this is fueling the uh, nationalist narrative and undermining the union, and uh, all of this now very clearly, a feeling that um, we need to um, claim credit for the things that the UK has done. They try to do that on the vaccine rollout. Uh, they're certainly going to try to do it on the levelling up fund, which of course doesn't generate Barnett consequentials, which also uh, adds to the constitutional debate. However, one could argue that at the end of the day, the, the, the lesson of the pandemic is that actually what matters is not necessarily who does what, or indeed outcomes, but actually the adroitness of those who are responsible for the policy. Um, you know, it is quite remarkable that um, both uh, Nicola Sturgeon and Mark Drakeford have emerged from this pandemic as strengthened politically, as people thinking they've handled the pandemic well, even though they've pretty much made much of the same mistakes and they've pretty much come up with much the same outcome, whereas the UK government has ended up uh, in a much worse situation. Now, you might say, well, that's Labour folk in, in, in Wales, of course, saying the Welsh government is doing better and um, it's uh, Conservatives in Scotland say, uh, Nationalists in Scotland saying Nick Sturgeon do well. And that's not the case. Even amongst unionists in Scotland, very high regard, uh, a much higher regard for Nicola Sturgeon's handling of the pandemic than Boris Johnson. So, you know, a, a lesson here is that you can try, you can try to spend a lot of money, you can try to do things, but at the end of the day, you've got to get the political messaging right. Boris Johnson made numerous mistakes with the political messaging over the pandemic, which cost him politically, certainly outside of England, um, uh, whereas uh, both Mark Drakeford and Nicola Sturgeon paid the pandemic much more effectively. So here's an example where the effectiveness of politicians proves to be more important than the flow of money. Well, I think that's, uh, that's, that's absolutely right. Although I would wonder how many Welsh Conservatives would take the same view of Mark Drakeford as Scottish Conservatives do of Nicola Sturgeon. And my sense is that Drakeford may be benefiting somewhat from people who are Plaid supporters, but who like a distinctive Welsh position, uh, uh, sort of even though it's, it's Labour. There's quite a large sort of quote unquote progressive nationalist overlap in Labour and Plaid, sure. uh, Plaid support. We're coming to the to the very end of our time. I'm really sorry. There are loads of questions that have been that have been asked that we that that we won't be able to to get to. Vernon Bogdan has asked whether uh, 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 Englishness varies depending on distance from London and Westminster. Uh, David Walker has asked about um, uh, nationalisms being false constructs, and if it's too late for a for a GB nationalism to be developed. Uh, but if you uh, just go go round uh, quickly, in case anyone wants to respond to any of those things or or any of the uh, any of the questions that have been raised, John. Very quick response to David Walker's question. The crucial thing, of course, to understand, and it's been underlined by the research by Ailsa and Richard is that Britishness has been constructed differently in the four parts of the UK. And that's central as to why it doesn't mean the same thing. You know, one obvious example, multicultural, multi-ethnic uh, 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 conceptions of the United Kingdom in, in England have been promoted through British identity rather than English identity in Scotland because of the nationalist commitment to civic uh, conceptions of uh, belonging. Um, Scottishness has been promoted as the multicultural identity. So the way in which politicians frame Britishness has varied across the four parts of the UK. And that's why in the end, it's rather a fragile construct upon which to rest a union. Thank you, John. Um, anyone else want to jump in for a very brief last uh, last word? In terms of Vernon Bogdan, I would I would uh, draw his attention to an excellent new book by Ilse Henderson and myself called Englishness, which answers all of his questions. <laughs> But the short answer, the short answer is no. If you if you wanted to save your if you wanted to save your no, money. No, 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 you're not you're not supposed to. <laughs> so on that 
advertorial. I think Philip was going to come in there. Oh no, so, I was just going to say the the emotion. The, I think the thing that's that's so striking about this was in 2014, and the referendum has been uh, very much most, uh, since then. Is the draining of the emotional case for the union? Um, I think reinforced by what everybody said about different perceptions in different parts of the UK. And it seems to me in England, as much as in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, reconnecting with that emotional case is Im really important if the union is to survive, but hugely difficult. We've, had, we've identified lots of problems today, but not many solutions. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, thank the audience, uh, thank uh, um, uh, Martha behind the scenes for UK and a Changing Europe who makes all this possible, and particularly to thank uh, the panel for what has been a fascinating and excellent uh, discussion this afternoon. So thank you all very much. In